Let's take a good deep breath. We're not going to take a break. Sorry. We're just going to keep rolling through. How is the temperature in here? You comfortable? Hot? It's a Maybe little warmish. Maybe we can open that door there. We've asked them for the um, <laughs> air, but yeah, uh, but everybody's hot over here, so you, you could. Um, then if wait, say it again. Up. Okay, hot people go sit by the door. Okay. Cold people go sit over here. <laughs> I never understand that. When we're dealing with subjects like this, like the light body, uh, enlightenment or anything, the energy tends to get kind of thick and heavy. So we'll get a little fresh air as we go into the, uh, our next presentation. If you are going to use the bathroom, please come back in through the back door there. We're not going to make you not go, uh, <laughs> but uh, come in through the back. So a good deep breath and our next presenter. As we mentioned earlier, is a gentleman that we actually met on the phone, I think, had him on our Awakening Zone show, and we're, we're so impressed with his energy, his style, his demeanor, everything about him that we said, John, you need to be here at the New Energy Conference. He's the author of a wonderful book called Addictions Unplugged. Oh my God, any time I had looked up some things, he, it's so congruent with Crimson Circle and what we're doing in the new energy. Even, and, and I love this because it has a lot of, just let me read this, drawing on modern day scientific discoveries, ancient spiritual wisdom, and real life testimonies, John Flaherty resources readers with the practical means to move beyond the drama of addictive behaviors, leading the way out from victim mentality and into more compelling, spiritually liberating and empowered way of living. And when we've heard him talk, when, when we've gotten to work with him, with John, it was very interesting because what he talks about in terms of a, a new and a more effective way to work with this, it applies to life, not just addiction, because it goes way beyond that. Well, and, and uh, you might ask, well, what, is, what does addictions have to do with a light body? Well, we become very addicted to our old physical patterns and the very thing that kind of keeps us from that graceful integration with the light body. John is a former Catholic priest, so watch your language here. <laughs> I just want to no, 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 I want to no. confess her something. Yeah, I just no, thought, yeah, you're, you're I allowed to confess it. Fault. Yeah, you're I allowed to bad. confess it. Jeffrey. I, you know, I kneel down. Yes, I will, Father. <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> this is going to take more than an hour. <laughs> if you keep talking like that, it will. Oh, yes. I, I, but I do have to tell a story. So I used to go to confession when I was young. Yeah. And... Uh, I didn't know what to confess. I mean, not that I hadn't done anything wrong, but it's like, geez, I really, it's none of your business, you know? And so I had my list every time. Uh, I swore five times, I hit my brother five times, and I <laughs> had dirty thoughts. No, I didn't have those back then. Uh, the, uh, but I did something. It was the same thing. And after, no, not back then. No, that's not bad. Right? No, he didn't not start smoking until he was 12. Not, not a sin, yeah, I didn't, not until he was 12. <laughs> so it was after about three years. I heard that little door slide open. He said, Jeff, is that you again? <laughs> <laughs> the same. You thought I would have been original and created different. But anyway, I had to share that. I'm always uh, kind of nervous in the presence Jeff, of, presence of Jeff, a Jeff, confess to him <laughs> later, later. This is his hour. Anyway, please welcome John Flaherty. Water here? How's that? I can hear that. That's good. Yes, thanks for your beautiful welcome. And um, I was very, very impressed to hear all those different countries that were mentioned. This is my first visit to Austria. I hope it's not my last visit to Austria. It's certainly not my intention for it to be my last visit to Austria. And indeed, I look forward to an invitation to the other 23 countries that were mentioned a little bit earlier. <clears throat> what are you laughing at? I'm already there. I'm just waiting for your invitation. That will make me feel a whole lot more comfortable and at home. Thanks very much. Do you know 
that you're infinitely greater than your thoughts would otherwise have you think you are. Good. (laughs) Because of course you are. Do you know that you're infinitely greater than your behaviors and your reactions would otherwise have you continue to be behaving as? Do you know that you're infinitely greater than your beliefs have kept you believing that you are? It's good. It's even more good than your last good. Because now we're really talking light body. Now we're really talking realizing the truth of who you really are. You see, I don't intend to spend a second of my very precious hour with you today and the time with you tomorrow convincing you of a belief. And I don't want you to spend a second trying to add such a belief to your already accumulated beliefs and thoughts and nice ideas. Because beliefs and thoughts and nice ideas simply don't change anything. Why would you want to prolong the misery of who you're very definitely not? Why would you want to do that? Only because you've got used to doing it, I suggest. How about getting quickly unused to doing that? I suggest now. Because there really is only now. How many times have you heard that? Or did that just sound like another nice idea? Or did it just become another belief that you liked the sound of? There really is only now. Now, now, in half an hour's time, it'll still be just now. And when I see you tomorrow, guess what? Yeah, you've guessed. Still be now. It's a beautiful thing about time. It just simply does not exist. Unless, of course, we believe or keep thinking that it does, in which case everything has to take such a very, very long time. And it's such very, very hard work. And it's so incredibly tiring to this poor little body that tries to manage it all. I've been given a very, very grand title today to speak about, topic if you like. It's living your truth. It's looking at what we sometimes call awakenings moving to what we sometimes call enlightenment, so that you can actually now realize your light body. And if you just kept that at the intellect alone, it would be very, very boring. So I don't suggest you do that, because that would just be adding to all the accumulated things that you've always added to in the past. And that, as I say, simply doesn't change anything. So I should really say to you, in whatever message I have to share with you today and tomorrow, which of course still be the now, don't believe a word I say. (laughs) Don't even think about it. Not a single word do I want you to believe that I've uttered today. I want you to realize the message that I have to share with you today. I want you to make it your real. Then you'll know that you're living your truth. Why? Because it'll be your truth. And you'll be able to feel it. Feel it. It won't just be another thing that you've accumulated as a belief 
or a thought that's become a behavior that suddenly becomes a life situation. Because if you keep doing that, well, we know what happens. Beliefs do create our thoughts. Our thoughts do create our behaviors. Our behaviors, in turn, create our life situations. More of the same life situations, more of the same beliefs. More of the same beliefs, more of the same thoughts. More of the same thoughts, more of the same behaviors, more of the same behaviors, more of the same life situations, more of the same life situations, more of the same old beliefs. But of course, they're getting bigger now, aren't they? Bigger belief in the last situation that was so very miserable to be existing in anyway, becoming more of a thought, very heavy thought, very burdensome thought, feel it in our body kind of thought, becoming a new life situation. Albert Einstein says, insanity is doing the same old thing over and over again, expecting different results. I'm not going to even join the dots after that. You've guessed the rest. Are you going to keep living that insane behavior from those ridiculous beliefs that have created such unnecessary thoughts about yourself? Or are you going to realize the truth of who you really are? Why not just do it now, in the now? Nowadays, I probably only have one true spiritual mentor. He's four and a half years old. I absolutely adore that child. Because my great nephew, Aidan, has taught me everything about life that at one time I thought I didn't know, that I had created as a belief about myself that I thought was so very important. And he has instead turned it all around, just like that. Because you see, if something's not happening for Aiden in the now, it's just not happening. <laughs> you know, Aiden could have had the most marvelous day yesterday, packed with fun, could have gone to the beach, could have played every game imaginable. And if I ask Aiden, didn't we have a great day yesterday? Aiden just looked blank. He would just say, can we just do it now? <laughs> because that's all that exists. If you spend time telling Aidan what a fabulous day we're going to have tomorrow, guess what? Can we just do it now? Can we just do it now? So you tell me, if you can, how on earth did we remove ourselves from that beauty, that truth, that real, that light body? that Aiden is, uh, that we think we still have to do so many things to make our real. How did we possibly forget to remember? How did we forget to remember? Well, you know and I know how we forgot to remember. We form beliefs about life. And our beliefs about life quickly became our thoughts about life. And our thoughts about life, guess what, became our behaviors. You know the role I'm on, don't you? And our behaviors became our life situations. Until Aidan came along, I don't think I really got the full realization of that. So I'm deeply indebted to my great, underlined, great nephew. Because he's taught me who I truly am. I am that I am. I am, it's worth repeating, that I am. And there's not a single soul could possibly take that away from me. In fact, you will also be realizing much the same by now about yourselves. Because as you become more consciously aware, and that arguably is the very same as becoming more enlightened, then it is a process of giving yourself back to yourself. And you'll feel it. 
You won't need it to be verified. It won't really matter what you were taught to believe or who taught you what to believe. So if you really think about it, and sometimes there is a good reason why we can think about it, but I'll come to that in a moment. Our thinking capacity is a very marvelous thing, but really all our thinking capacity can at best do is give us what has already been given to it. If we really want to know the truth, the real essence about ourselves, we have to go to a different place. We have to go to the heart. Jean just mentioned it a little while ago. It's crucial that we go from head to heart. Now, I know, Institute of Heart Math knows, that the energy of the heart is 5,000 times more electromagnetically powerful than that which we ordinarily place such reliance upon. Why on earth are we not using it, therefore, to its full capacity? You see, I don't know any of you very well at all. I've got to know some of you just a little bit. But if I go to my heart, I, all, I know all that there is to know. Because it's the one same knowing that's even worth knowing. It tells me that there is simply no separation between this body and your individual body. And that brings about the most magnificent things in life. It literally is our first experience of the light body. When we're beginning to actually communicate and live and think and believe and allow and behave from the heart in what inevitably feels like a much lighter body because we're not carrying the heaviness of this individual sense of self that seems so very separate from everything else when in actual fact how could it be because the institute of heart math already has simply discovered that that energy that heart energy will extend something like 15 feet from me to this man sitting in the very front row here that also means that my very dear, beautiful wife, who's back home in England, watching the webcast. I hope, where are you? Hello, my darling. <laughs> will also be experiencing that very same heart energy from me right now, because she'll only be sitting, what, this distance away from the, the computer. And she'll know that my heart energy is already meeting with hers, and indeed with all of the other people watching on the webcast. Because think of it this way. Where does my 15 feet end? This man or this man or this lady's 15 feet begin. Is there a difference? Of course there isn't, is there? If you've ever had to go for an ECG examination, be clipped up in the way that those examinations are made, doctor will possibly think that you know they're recording your heart energy well are they <laughs> is it all that the machinery is recording it's highly unlikely is it because in the room there's going to be you the doctor and possibly the nurse so what's it really picking up and ultimately does it really matter it might to the doctor but it really doesn't to the truth of who you are. When we begin to feel that depth, that expansion of consciousness, which our heart knows and our head gets very frustrated at and doesn't really want to fully accept, but eventually will tag along quickly with it, magnificent things begin to happen. As Linda said in the announcement, large part of my life, not all of it, as you heard from Jeff, in a former life was a Catholic priest. There are many wonderful experiences from that, but there were equally good, equally good reasons for myself 
why it was very important to depart from that too. Because I followed my heart rather than my head. But for about the last 20 years, I've been working very much in what's called the field of addiction. And for the most part, that's been with people who would be described as alcoholic or dependent on substances or gambling or have got caught up in pornography or you name it, smoking excessively, whatever it is that they desperately want to change about themselves and simply don't know how. However, however, I've discovered that as long as I sit with that individual, I really speak to them as though I was speaking to myself, which indeed is what I am doing, amazing things begin to happen. Because the heart energy is indeed the light body. And the person who is in their addictive behavior, I assure you, for the most part, in fact, yeah, just about everybody I've had the privilege to meet in their addictive behavior is arguably so much further ahead of most of us. Because everything, every single thing in their person tells them there must be something more to life than my current experience has been showing me. They know that desperately desperately looking to realize it, to make it there real. And they try very, very hard, desperately looking for it. Can't possibly settle or stay in their former body. What that other great spiritual teacher, Eckhart Tolle, so beautifully and succinctly described as their pain body. No, they can't be, they can't be doing with that any longer. See, their pain body has come about because they never did really fit in very easily to the expectations of others. They weren't meant to. Many of them actually are really great spiritual teachers. Many of them actually are like my great nephew, Aidan, who simply desires it to be happening now. Now. They are the more readily able people to just do, let's pretend. And then the game of life does commence. And only judgment, which we're very ready to meet out to somebody else, can possibly persuade us otherwise. And in doing so, we miss such a lot. Now, in truth, we're all addicted. We're addicted, largely speaking, to the untruth of who we are. We're addicted to our thoughts about things. We're addicted to our beliefs that create those thoughts, that create the behaviors, that bring about those same old, same old life situations. We're addicted until we're not. Until we're not. That seems easy, doesn't it? It seems easy to the addict. Once they're able to put that world into such a different perspective. See, they've just got so used to hearing, got to go to a meeting. Do you know? They're to be sitting through and be judged even more by their peers, by themselves, even worse. They've got used to trying very hard to put into practice a relapse prevention program. Think of the words. Relapse prevention program. Wow. Have we not heard of the law of attraction? <laughs> relapse prevention program. Come on, guys, you know, more relapse, isn't it? A huge invitation, great big magnet to more of the same, more of the same, more of the same, more of the same belief, more of the same thoughts, more of the same behavior, more of the continued miserable life situation. 
all because the individual is still looking outside of themselves for someone else to have the answer about ourselves. Oh, wow, what a crime that is. Tell me this. Of the beliefs that you have about anything, where have they come from? Where have they come from? If you think really carefully enough about it, I'll guarantee you will begin to realize that our beliefs about ourselves and about our life, largely speaking, come from people who've never once stopped yet to ask themselves, who am I? Who haven't necessarily got anywhere near experiencing their light body or the truth of who they are. Because they've come from the beliefs of those who passed their beliefs onto them, who are doing the same onto whoever else comes into their wake. And so the story of life continues very slowly, very repetitiously, unendingly so, very heavy body, very difficult experience. Life seems incredibly separate. Individual sense of self seems incredibly small. Very, very fearful. Very unsure. Lacking seemingly in everything. Excuse, apology for life itself. Now, even as I'm speaking those words to you, you must be feeling the heaviness in your own self. Why? Because I'm speaking from the heart to your heart, and you will feel that burdensome thought attached to whatever belief you may now have, which I'm suggesting you slip out from. Just slip out from that otherwise victim consciousness. Now, I'm using a term slip out from victim mentality or victim consciousness very, very purposefully. You see, if you think you have to beat an addiction, fight a thought, overcome your eating problem, uh, ward off the demon inside, do you know? Oh. Shrug off the monkey on the shoulder. Can you hear the language of it? Where do we come up with such sensational language about nothing? About nothing. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Because it's been a belief that was passed on as a thought that we actually inherited. And guess what? Before we know it, we're speaking it. Even worse, we're living it. And then we feel it. And we say it's our truth. It's no more a truth. It's the biggest lie that we could have ever come up with. And it came from someone else. Let go of it. Slip out from victim mentality. And I, Chambre, you know, I am thrilled to be in your presence, but I've heard it even today, there's still enough of victim consciousness preventing you, getting in the way of you being you. And only fear could possibly keep that alive and as a possibility. Make it now your choice to unreal it, unknow it, slip out from victim consciousness. Be the truth of who you really are. Great nephew Aidan would quickly be able to explain just what you have to do in order for that to become your experience. Shall we just do it now, he would say. Can we not just get on with it? <laughs> See, Aidan doesn't even bother saying, let's pretend. You know. If he wants to be Superman, he just says, I am that I am. He just says, I am Superman. And so he is. And so he is. How did we ever learn to forget to remember that truth then about ourselves? Unlearn it. Quick. 
Go free. Go free. Go free. That's what freedom is. Freedom is enlightenment. Freedom is acceptance of the truth of who you truly are. Freedom, enlightenment, is a non-resistance to it. No matter how tempting other people will want to keep us in our pain body experience. And there's no shortage of them. It's usually family. It's always family. Always. Why? Because, well, they like to keep us in pretty well much the same way as they preferred to keep us. Then they, then they know who we are. <laughs> Doesn't do much for you, but seems to keep the other reasonably happy about it. Forget about trying to keep anybody happy. First of all, there's no way we can ever keep anybody happy. <laughs> no way. Let them be very miserable. <laughs> very, very unhappy. Because it will be a wonderful invitation to them. And the invitation will be this. There's your first experience of knowing who you're not. <laughs> That's good, that, isn't it? There's your first experience of knowing who you're not. And do you know what? It's the easiest way to do this. Discover who you're not. You're not just this body and all its aches and pains. You're not just your thoughts. You're not just your beliefs. You're not just your behaviors. You're not your mother. That's good news, isn't it? You're not your mother. That's, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would like to see a lot more people doing that Wolfing's doing. You're not your mother. You're not your father. You're not your job. You're not whatever you've come up with to convince you that you were that. As you discover who you're not, you're able to move immediately to the next level of conscious awareness. Like a dog looking for a bone, you uncover the truth of who you really are. Got to get the other stuff out of the way with first, though. The dog knows it's left it somewhere, and so do you. That's why you're sitting here today. <laughs> you see, you know who you really are. And I don't care how much you pretend, otherwise you know you're a light body. Only your beliefs, only your thoughts, only your behaviors, only those life situations stemming from those behaviors, those thoughts, those beliefs, could possibly have kept that untruth about yourself, seeming like it was cast iron, guaranteed truth. I tell you what, it's a lie. Let go of the lie and you'll feel the light body, all right. You'll feel it. You'll feel it. Feel it now. I'm going to invite you to feel it now. Otherwise, guess what? You'll have gone straight back up to head. We don't want that to happen. Feel it now. 15 feet, my heart energy, and I tell you what, it's totally open to every single one of you because you've already invited me to your 24 countries and I've already got on that aeroplane and I am there to speak this message because this is not John Flaherty speaking. This message is a message for life. It is the truth about life that happens just to be coming out of my mouth but from my heart. And I know this to be a truthful message because I lived long enough in the untruth of who I'm definitely not. And I can know immediately what that difference feels like. And it feels very, very light. Very light. So feel it. I'm going to wait. I can wait. I'm here at least until Monday morning. But there's only the now, so let's do it now. And I'm going to so much send my light body love 
to you, to every single one of you, that if you would be so kind to just cooperate with me, it'll do my ego the world of good. <laughs> but I know that's who I'm not. It'll do my heart the power of good because that's who I know that we are. And I just simply want you to give me a little wave, put up your hand, do a something, when you can feel that heart energy really, really present in your light body. Then you will have reeled the unreal in you. So, out goes my love. There it goes. When you feel the connectivity, give me a little wave. Hello, there's the first little wave. Thanks, Doug. Bless you. Wow, that's awesome. Come on. What about the rest of you? Hey, hands up. <laughs> Come on. This is for real. Come on, feel it. Feel it. Don't let the head get in the way of the heart. Feel it. Love it. Love yourself back into life. Love it. Love it. Love it. Be the truth of who you really are. The truth. Awakening. It's a funny little word, isn't it? We use it lots enough. Let me, let me share with you what I've made of that word, awakening. I have no doubt that for some people, awakening can come very fast. It can be incredibly blissful. It can soar. It can elevate the spirit in an instant. That didn't happen to me. I was a very slow learner. That's why I'm so eager now for now. That's really why I'm encouraging you to do likewise. You see, Marie Curie, I think it was, that said... Pain is inevitable, but suffering is totally optional. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, totally optional. You know, I can stand on this man's foot, I wouldn't dream of doing it, and that would be painful. All he would really need to do is say, John, could you not do that? And suffering would no longer need to be. It's a choice, it's a decision. And I tell you, not to decide is also to decide. So decide today for you, the truth of who you are. Then you'll know your money was well spent. Then you'll know also that it was well worth sitting through for these sessions and meeting the people you've been meeting with and putting up with some of the people that you didn't really care for and doing all of those things. You'll have discovered, discovered, not recovered. That's another story. I'll share that with you tomorrow. Recovery, process of, we could be at that forever and most people are. Discover the truth of who you are. So the discovery for myself took a long time. For the most part, I did that with my very beautiful wife, who at one time I used to think was my soul mate, but now I really, really know her to be my twin flame. It's unusual that she's not with me in person, because ideally, do you know what? We love to actually share the message, which is one message, as one. But today, Jeff and Linda could only afford one of us. <laughs> And they took the cheapest option. <laughs> but I am here to tell you, for what it's worth, and really, I, for what it's worth, some of the awakening times of my own, and as I'm telling you those bits and pieces, just simply, if you would, Think of some of the ones that will have been your own. And God, I could be here ad infinitum. God, I'm going to pick out several of them that come to mind. The first of them, now that I think about it, because hindsight is a marvelous thing, 
came to me years ago when I was still a Catholic priest. And you know, at that time, I would, I always enjoyed public speaking, as you might guess. <laughs> but I used to do it from an entirely different starting place. I did it totally from the ego, totally from there, totally from head, didn't even think that there was such a thing as heart. I used to do it with great intention. Thursday afternoons was my preferred time, especially if it was horrible rainy outside. I would curl up and say, great, the whole of this afternoon is going to be spent preparing Sunday's sermon. I'd spend ages at it. I'd have every single word laid out in front of me. I would even go into the empty church. I would practice it. I had every single word just in front of me. And people would come to me afterward and they would say, Oh, Father John, that was beautiful. That was good. Wow, wow. And we love to hear you speak. We love to hear that. We love to, and I would feel really good. Really, really good. Until one day, her name's Eileen. I can see her face as clear as clear as could be, even though I'm talking nearly 30 years ago. And Eileen made sure she had a room full of people, and she picked her time very, very well. And she said to me, Father John, you've got feet of clay. Wow, feet of clay. She really meant, you know, there's no foundation behind what I was putting out there. My ego was devastated. The people around her were devastated. How could you say such a thing about our lovely Father John, you know? <laughs> I tell you, I assure you this, although it's a, that did take some recovering from, Eileen did me the greatest service she ever could. Because although it did take hindsight, she helped me discover who I really was not. You see, how can you prepare something from your heart to reach another person's heart on a Thursday, deliver it on a Sunday, <laughs> Saturday evening mass, 8 o'clock mass, same one, word for word, verbatim, 11 o'clock mass, 6 o'clock Sunday night mass, You know, it's just not going to do it, is it? Because it's not a truth. It's not a now. It's not a living. Another experience maybe that comes to mind would be it lasted all of about three minutes. But it wasn't a nice experience. And I really knew after 11 years in the priesthood that it, was, it really was time for me to make the change. Because... Over the years, my soul was becoming more and more diminished, or so it felt. Because I was trying, being the operative word, trying very hard to make something of the individual uniqueness about me fit the expected norm for me. The authority, the dogmas, the, the everything, the whole rigmarole, the regulations, the the very limited version of what I signed up for but quickly began to realize simply was not going to contain the truth of me. And in the trying to do so, I felt desperately unhappy. Desperately unhappy. And for about three minutes one morning, it was about 8.15 one morning, for the very first time, I actually had what a person might describe as a suicidal inclination. I actually, for that split short period of time, thought, I wonder if I, because I didn't know, I straddled the thing. How do I, how do I be this and keep this thing going here? <laughs> it's pretty precarious, isn't it, for a man? <laughs> how do I do that? And I couldn't. I could not do it. I could not do it but I didn't know how else. I had no idea what the else was. 
because I was in my head and I hadn't gone to my heart. I didn't know there was a light body at all. Eileen was right. Feet of clay. And the moment passed, but the reason the moment passed was because life literally burst in on the scene. The telephone rang. I picked up the telephone and heard this beautiful little voice. Hello, Uncle John. Love you. Oh, wow. Then his mummy came on. This was my nephew, Christopher. His mummy, Bernadette, who's now already passed on. And Bernadette said, Little Christopher was just about ready to go to school today, but very unusually, he just said, can I phone Uncle John? Wow. Okay. That's the light body. It was Christopher's and it was mine. <coughs> That's the truth of what life actually really is, unless we're in some kind of belief or thought or behavior about it, so that we, l we miss it completely. I didn't miss it. I did not miss that. But as a result, it naturally moved me on to a different experience of me, an entirely different experience of me. How could it not? I hadn't a clue what to do with my life. I'd spent 13 years from the age of 11 to 24 training to be a priest. I'd spent 11 years trying to be it. When my first job came along, I distinctly remember asking my then wife, what do you do? <laughs> How do you know what to do when you go to a job? I, I, what do you do? <laughs> what, what's one of them? <laughs> what's a job? I had a clue. My first job was actually, you know, talk about choosing hard options, was to be the, the clinical director of HIV and AIDS. And at that time, very, very little was known about HIV AIDS. Within a short time after that, I'm going back to the uh, 90s, late 80s, 90s. Princess Diane, no time, was kind of shaking hands and hugging people with HIV. I, having been the hospital chaplain of infectious diseases, and this newfound thing called HIV AIDS, went in to see those people on those wards dressed up a little bit like an astronaut, just in case. In my job as clinical director of HIV AIDS, I was called to the hospital dressed like an astronaut. And there I saw one of my fellow priests dying. Do you think I kept the astronaut outfit on? No. no. Okay. Loved, loved that guy. Because he was loving me. It was very easy to do that. When you love, just to do the same, isn't it? Without even having to think about it. And that very night, he passed on. And that very day, I did too to a different realization about myself. That's an awakening. Then came the day where it dawned on me. I was out of the priesthood. It was a hot, sunny day. I had my shades on. Put down the right-hand drive, I have to remember. Down with the winder, too, in those days. Window went down feeling good, put on my favorite piece of music at that time. I remember it now. I still play it. It always really brings a good feeling back to me. The group was called Deacon Blue. A really good high-energy song. I remember the guy at the traffic light shouting, what they call that guy? By the time I'd passed, it was time to go through the track. I don't think he got to know yet what they called the, the track, and I certainly didn't get to tell him. But the good feel came because I realized that the floodgates had opened. Not only would I, had I moved on from my experience of what I was experiencing, but I realized actually I could be with my now twin flame, my beautiful wife, Anne Louise. 
and that the real awakening that was waiting for me was an entirely different experience of who we both now are. An entirely different one. A one that felt so much more in tune with the truth of who we are. I am that I am. That's an awakening also. And I turned up the volume and off I went to see her. And I knew things were going to be different and they always have. However, awakenings aren't just all nice things, I'm telling you, uh, HIV, AIDS, and feet of clay, not a nice experience to have experienced. But there are awakenings nonetheless. And they become our enlightenment in due course when we simply connect the dots and see the truth that's actually really speaking to us through our hearts. And then I was in my job, which by this time I had got a bit better at knowing what to do as I turned up there each day. And suddenly there was no job. Job ended. Oh, no job. Oh my God. <laughs> went back home to my very lovely wife. We both went into panic mode. No job, no income, no nothing. You spent all those training to be a Catholic priest and you're not one. You just found your newfound skill and you're not one of those either. And it was devastation time. Totally devastating in our lives. And had a huge, huge ripple effect for a long, long, long time to come. Because decisions do. That's why we have to be very careful of the decisions that we're making about anything. Because they always have consequences. And the decision we made was to go into abject fear. Now at that time, fairly early on in our married life, it had been our total expectation to have our own very lovely children. But because we went into such fear mode, it even got in the way of our intimacy. It just does. Dr. Doug will probably explain that better to you. Physically, we actually just shut down. So much was our belief in the possibility of lack. That life could not actually come and serve us. That we were being put on hold, waiting for the next thing to possibly happen, far removed from living in the now. We were about to go to the German markets. <laughs> Remember, I'm from England. And although it was only going to be a few days away, and we had actually put some money aside to enjoy this thing, just prior to the Christmas time was the very first thing we cancelled on the spot. Just in case there wasn't going to be enough, <laughs> e enough money <laughs> to make it work. Just in case. Have I gone off? Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep going, I'll keep shouting. Linda's on her way with another microphone. <coughs> but there is only the now. And so we did. And that decision, really, as I say, had its real knock-on effect for a very, very long time to come. I don't think it's on Linda, actually. <coughs> because a belief in lack suddenly took central place in our lives. And it stayed there for a very long time. And suddenly we felt incredibly dependent again, incredibly fearful again. All the old behaviors came back in again with all the thoughts that had preceded them, stemming from all the beliefs we'd ever heard in the past, all the ones I ever heard about my mother from my mother about times when my father had been out of work and what the consequences would be. I'm sure you've had the experiences that I'm experiencing. <coughs> Devastation, all because of a belief. A belief. That's why I'm very, very, very keen on you not believing a word I say. But I want you to feel the truth is the message that I'm sharing with you 
nonetheless. Be careful about the decision you make and where you're making that decision from. Time went on. Jobs came thick and fast. It's only a job. Jump out of bed, J-O-B. And we found ourselves in Canada, in Vancouver. And there was a wonderful person there. She was a community nurse. And she said to me, John, would it be a good idea to have a visit to downtown Eastside, Vancouver? Downtown Eastside, Vancouver is like some apocalyptic version of hell. <laughs> it's seriously not good. Seriously not good. And you know when you're entering there because there's a heavy, dense, negative energy that actually takes you with it until it doesn't. But she said, just come wearing a pair of hard shoes because there'll be glass and there'll be syringes and there'll be, and I thought, okay, here we go. <laughs> All these manner of things are waiting you. Actually, that wasn't the problem. But some of the places that she went to, and remembering she was the community nurse, she went there into these dark, fearful places simply to administer to them, treat the opportunistic, opportunistic infections, go and just see if the person was still alive. And we went into some very dark, dingy corridors. And each time she would appear there and she would knock on the door. Now, I, I tell you, I have had some experiences in my life, but on that occasion, I couldn't help but being fearful. Because I knew that from the way these people were living, I had no idea who was behind the other side of the door whether they had a double barrel shotgun, because they were all living in fear, abject fear, of others, or a machete. But you would hear these very gruff groans, voices. In fact, the one we got was, fuck off, bastard. But she taught me a very beautiful thing. Because she went with such purity of love, the fearfulness on the other side of the door disappeared. Disappeared. Completely. A little head would maybe peer out the door. A gentler sounding voice would maybe come from the other side of the door. And she would go on and do her job that she went to do. That's how powerful the heart, light, body, realization, love is. It changes everything. 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 There are a number of awakenings. I don't know how many I've listed. Seven, six. I could have listed 600, 700. They'll continue. But after a time... You no longer have to think of, that's an awakening, whoa. That's an awakening, whoa. They just actually become a more enlightened state of being. You're just being the truth of who you are. And there's no room for fear in that. You just know, I am love. Let's pretend. Isn't it just happening now? as my great nephew would be quick to remind me. The purity of that, suddenly we have to then begin not to forget to remember. Not to forget to remember. It's all we need to not forget to do. Remember. Remember. What does that mean? like a soldering iron. You know what one of those is? You know? Suddenly two bits of, and then suddenly one. <laughs> Melding. Bringing the two as one. It's a reuniting. Untruth for truth. Fear for love. Unreal for real. Lack for endless possibility. 
That's the game of life. It's a beautiful game once we know the rules. I didn't know how to play the rules. I do now a lot better and simply not to be frightened of the truth of who we are. Not to go scurrying looking for somebody else's belief about something and then trying desperately to make it your own. Not to try getting stuck and then make work a thought that simply isn't going to work, could never possibly work, no matter how hard you try. Not to persist with a behavior or a reaction that is simply that, a reaction. But to actually be the action, be the presence, be the truth of who you are. That feels very light. It's a quickened energy. Tomorrow, which will be the now, I look forward to speaking with you again for a little while tomorrow afternoon. Possibly, I look a little bit more with you at the whole field of addictions. And maybe you'll recognize that the message of my book, Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free, will be as applicable to you as indeed it could be to anybody who has thought themselves to be addicted. And if that's the case, then I'll know why I have been gifted to be in your presence today. And you'll possibly get an inkling of why you've been gifted to hear the message of that which I have been very privileged to share with you from my awakenings to become more at one with you in your current enlightened state of being. And how wonderful that truly is. Do you know, if you want to do something that you've never done before, you have to do something that you've never done before. <laughs> if you want to behave in a way that you've never behaved before, you have to behave in a way that you've never behaved before. If you want a light body experience that you've never experienced before, you tell me, what do you have to do? In the now, come on. You have to be the experience of the light body that you've never experienced before. Okay, here's something I want you to consider doing. Those of you who are on Facebook, I don't like Facebook, I don't use Facebook like normal people, but I do actually have a Facebook page. And if you look at the Facebook page, don't just look at it, click a like, I like you to like me. <laughs> and have a little look at the page. Be aware, be alive. And you'll see there that each day I put a tiny little message that goes beyond thought. And it will begin. Don't forget to remember. And then the little message. So I invite you to have a little look at that message. Have a little look at it. See if it resonates. If it does, you'll feel it. If you're not forgetting to remember and you feel it, it will be a realization. It will be an awakening. It might even add to becoming an enlightenment. Buy my book. There are only 15 copies there. I'd be surprised if they're still there. <laughs> Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free. And know that I'm coming to your countries, but I'm awaiting your invitation so that I can share this message, not from John Flaherty. How would he know? 
but from the truth of I am, that very same I am, that indeed you are also. Last but not least, I'm going to leave you with four things to remember, should you forget to remember. Here they are. Number one, I cannot, I am not, and never can I be, separated from the source of life that sources me. Next thing to remember, should you forget to remember, I am all that I say that I am. The truth of who you are. Third thing to remember, should you forget to remember, I cannot not create. You know, my Catholic religion did get a few things right, and one of them would be, we're made in the image and the likeness of the creator. That means, same as image and likeness, no separation. You can either create chaos, havoc, most of us do, most of the time, or you can create magnificence, but you cannot not create. Don't forget to remember that. And finally, fourth thing to remember, should you still forget to remember? The meaning of life is the meaning that I give to it. Namaste. A big thank you to John Flaherty. Thank you, John. Also to Jean Tinder. Thank you, Jean. Now, now, with no delay, I know that you probably want to love your body and go do something. So please be back here for Kathumi in 30 minutes so at let's we'll be back here at 20 after promptly for a channel with kathumi okay so take care of you